Hello, hello, and welcome to the Literary Roadhouse Book Club. Today, we're discussing Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan. I'm Anais, joined by book club regular George. George. <laughs> Sorry. Brian, <laughs> I've been Bill. having one of those, like, weeks. Uh, <laughs> good news, all gets edited. Yeah. I'm Anais, joined by book club regular Gerald Hornsby and former Literary Roadhouse guest Colette Sartor. Hey, guys. Hey. hey. Hello. So good having you here, Colette. And as people don't know, this is sort of like you're coming back as former guests, but maybe you'll be a regular host. Yay! Yay. I love this. This is so much fun. Yeah. Aww, we like it too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we like we that it forces do. us to read too. Read different. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, seriously. It's heaven. <laughs> heaven. Heaven to have an excuse to say, I'm reading. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's um, start like we always do, which is just what was your overall impression, reception of the book? We'll start with Colette. Um, I, you know, I, and I, I've told you guys this before. I started this book when it first came out and I was, I'm a huge Jennifer Egan fan. So I was so excited for it. And I put it down at some point and didn't pick it back up. I wasn't as engaged. So when you guys approached me to, you know, do this conversation, like, you know, I wanted to go back to that. And this time around, I really couldn't put it down. I really, I loved it. Her language is masterful. I love the way she put the story together, the research, which I know is something we want to talk about. The research she put into the book was so clearly, it was so thorough. Uh, and I felt like I was learning something the whole time and yet still incredibly engaged with the characters. So I loved it. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I loved it too. I, Again, like Colette, I started it and thought, mm, I, I don't normally like novels that are sell, set in a, a sort of a, a certain period in, in history. I, I normally read contemporary novels. Um, so I struggled a bit initially, and it was just me. But then once you get into it, it, it becomes a real page turner. She, is, she really did, you know, the... the it, it, she weaved a great story. I mean, my, my partner's written a book that's sort of based in the um, based in the Spanish Civil War, but it's it's a love story. But the the, the war is very much in the background. It's just like just like a you know set a scenery for it. And, and this was the same. It struck me as being exactly the same that that you know there's a war going on, but actually it's just a vehicle to propel the narrative. So I I, I thought she did that very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I so like you guys, it was a page turner for me. I absolutely loved the book, though. And I, and I was saying this to Gerald in the pre-show. I feel like there's something I'm not getting, and it doesn't make me dislike the book. Like I know I'm not getting it, and I know the book is still like very good. And I it, I had a lot of fun reading it. It was just it was very engaging, um, especially something we're going to talk about later, which is all the minor details and the subplots are just like brilliant. Like sometimes yes. I like it better than the a plot. Like, yeah, I'm like, let's do this. Like, I just saw how one of my questions was like, can we have a story of Brienne, please? Brienne, yes, I totally agree with you. She's a great character. Yeah, she's she? a, man, amazing character. She's one of yeah. my favorites, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but I still feel like there's something that I, I haven't figured out yet. And what I'm hoping is, uh, I'm hoping that throughout this discussion, I'm going to figure out what that is. So I start that discussion so that I can figure out. Like, I just, I feel like my big question is, what's the big, like the thesis of the novel in a way? Like what's the big takeaway here? You know how a lot of novels you finish it and you have like the satisfying feeling on what you just chewed on? Like what's that big thing yeah. that the novel's exploring? And here, I don't know what it is. I agree with you. And in fact, I actually, when I finished it, I said to someone, my one disappointment was I felt like by the time I got near the end, it sped up. And it felt like, okay, it's time to wrap this up. And I wasn't quite sure what we were wrapping up. So as yeah. we're heading toward the end, as we're getting there, I'm thinking, well, what's going to be the big reveal? Because mm -hmm. she's dealt with this plot line. She's dealt with this plot line. And what's going to be the surprise? Because Jennifer Egan is, I love, like I, I, like I said, I love her. I've read pretty much everything she's written. I don't love every single book, but mm -hmm. she's just such a consummate storyteller that she always surprises me. And I mean, the reveal at the end, oh, I, I now I understand how he did it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't enough for me. And that no. was my big disappointment, I have to say. I felt the same way you did. You mm -hmm. said it better than I did because I couldn't put my finger on why I found the ending disappointment. Disappointing, I think you're right. I wasn't 
sure what it was about. Mm -hmm. It's for, for me, yeah, that the whole sort of back quarter, maybe back fifth of the book, you're right, Colette, it did seem to speed up. It did see, and it became more, almost more thrillerish. It, it became less of a, of a, of a well-crafted novel and more sort of, it's plot, plot, plot all the way yes. through. Um, and, you know, yes, so, and, and I, I thought the ending was a little bit convenient, you know, the, yes. the father comes back and, and they're sort of, sort of okay again. And um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say. So, like, let's let's talk about then the themes that we know she is exploring. So she touches on sexism, racism, yeah. disability, class. There's all these things that when she has a commentary on it, the commentary is brilliant and mm. beautifully drawn, and just kind of hits you in the gut or in the heart or wherever it's supposed to hit you. So I guess that's the thing. It's like she has these great insights and ideas about all of these different things and then i'm like but what's the, the you know like when you read a really yes. good book that you want to scream from like the the rooftops <laughs> it's because yeah. it's not just that it was a great plot which this had it's not just that it was beautifully written which this had but it had that like this takeaway everyone needs to learn with me right yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it, and i mean i i mean yeah. Clearly, she was exploring. I mean, it felt like to me she wa she wanted to explore responsibility, mm -hmm. and 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 how much love is tethered to responsibility and vice versa, and if that can keep you within a particular life. I mean, because if you're looking at um, Dexter versus Eddie versus Anna that's what they all kind of go through mm. but mm. ultimately anna is the main she is the main character because mm -hmm. she's the one where the other who the other characters revolve around and i never quite it it wasn't a deep enough journey for her like there were certain things that felt like they were placed there like the whole even the setup for her being willing to have an affair with dexter you know her sexuality like that kind of came out of nowhere. Mm. Mm. What, like, yeah. what was it like a, th a third? Into, I can't remember, but it almost felt like it was almost a third into the book where all of a sudden we find out that she's had this little, she's had this affair mm -hmm. when she was 14 or something, which I loved, but didn't feel organic to mm. her and who she'd been built up to be. So I was confused. I'm like, whoa, mm. why did this come out of nowhere? And then I saw as the book went on, it's so beautifully constructed. Oh, it's got to be here to set her up as a certain kind of person. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. I actually, I had an easier time accepting the affair when she was 14. Being oh, like, yeah. yeah. Then the Dexter yeah. one from both sides. I wasn't 100% sure why Anne is here or Dexter. Yep. Both yeah. of yep. them. I did not buy that. I agree. And yeah. the thing is, I could accept the affair at 14, like the, you know, having a lover at 14. That's not what I couldn't accept. It's that it came late enough that I was like, well, why didn't we know this about her sooner? Mm -hmm. We're so close to her. She's the main character. And we're finding this out pretty late and in a convenient way. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, because it's setting up the Dexter stuff. And then that's part of the reason I didn't buy the Dexter stuff, because it felt contrived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it and felt too fortuitous. Except here's the thing that's that's funny. I'm was it, okay, but also I don't know if you guys agree, but we all saw Dexter and Anna sleeping together from a mile away, right? Oh, it was God, heavily yes. foreshadowed. Yes. So yes. it's it's oh, so yeah. weird to have something so heavily foreshadowed, a foregone conclusion, and still be like, don't buy it. <laughs> yeah, strange. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and 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 the thing is, I loved both those characters. I did not yeah. expect to love Dexter, but I loved Dexter. Mm -hmm. I thought yeah. he was a really interesting character, and it's funny because. I think part of the reason I didn't like the book the first time is because the first time I read it, I confused, is this Donegan is the Eddie's Donnellan? friend? Donnellan. Mm -hmm. Donnellan, Donnellan, yeah. yeah. Donnellan. I confused him with Dexter. Mm. Yeah. The first time I read it and I'm like, oh, I don't buy this. And then when I read it again, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. But for me to have, and that was on me, but still, yeah, I, I I I did sometimes find because she she, she does chop and change between uh, across the timelines and and sometimes are in in backstory, sometimes in present day, and and sometimes that threw me a little, and and sometimes she did it within a chapter, and 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 I quite liked when she was when when a character um, 
I can't think of an example, but but there was a, there was a character going through a, a situation, and backstory was playing alongside it, and it and and it was it, it's quite good, but it, it it makes following it quite difficult sometimes. And then I find I found at the the, the start of the story that you had you seem to have quite a few characters named and brought to the fore, and you weren't quite sure apart from Anna who. Who were the other main characters in the story? It matter. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to say also something like the, the time jumping around didn't confuse me too much. I stayed with it. But sometimes I kept forgetting what Mick and Wop is. I was just like, wait a minute, these, this old time <laughs> really? slang. I had to keep like, oh. Yeah. Wow. It's funny because I grew up at, like on the East Coast mm -hmm. and I'm very, very, very Italian. And where I grew up, you're either Italian, you're Jewish, you're Irish, or you're black because I grew up in New Jersey. And so I'm very familiar with Mick and Wap mm -hmm. because my mother used to get so mad if I ever said Wap or Dago or she's like, those were curse words when I was a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But we heard those growing up. So, mm. you know, I'm still close enough to that generation that that didn't bother me. But, but, but I isn't, can tell that. But isn't yeah. it good that, that those words are are almost foreign words to people now? Yes. Yeah. And, 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 I'm really happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that, that's the other thing. Like, that's Because um, I also grew up in New Jersey, but I grew up, but again, oh, right. I, you know, you know in uh, mostly in the 90s and early aughts and in an area that's heavily Latino. So none of this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah, exactly. It's like, very different. Yeah, I'm like, this, this, is, this is not real. Even though <laughs> I, all the scenes where she's like, and I got off at Penn Station, left goes uptown. And I'm like, oh, I can picture this. I can picture her on 7th Avenue. Like, I know this area. And it felt foreign to me. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it, and, it, and it is so, it's funny, little details, you were talking about the beautiful little details, but little details like the Mick and the Wop stuff really rang true because, and I don't know a ton about this time period, but little things like I remember my mom, I remember growing up and knowing that, you know, when Italians first came to the United States and so many settled you know, in Manhattan, in the East Coast, and for a very long time, they were considered black they were considered colored mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i hung on to that for dear life when i was a kid because i i was i'm like well i'm darker than just about everybody i know so yeah mom i'm other and mm. i loved that i loved being other my mother's <laughs> like well honey we used to be considered other but and yeah. so that little detail in her that she had that fascinated me mm. like she <laughs> really did her research yeah. about what this time period was like you know, and it was the racism was so rampant, but it was a different kind of racism mm -hmm. because it was a little more widespread because the melting pot was so new mm. in terms of yeah. who was coming to the country. Um, yeah, it was fascinating. She Her research was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and because it was of, of the time, and we're going to get into the time in a minute, but because it was of the yeah. time, even the good characters you're supposed to be rooting for are still racist. All racist. Yeah. All, all of them. Yes. Anna has a little bit of an arc where she's like, in the beginning, is it pronounced Marley or Marley or Marl? I the, was Marl, Marl, maybe? I, I wasn't I sure either. Marl, yeah. Maybe Marl. I wasn't sure. But in the beginning, she's avoiding him. And yes. she's even embarrassed that she's avoiding him, right? <laughs> and then at least by the end of it, they're friends, they're writing back and forth. So she has a little bit of like an, an arc there, but everyone's racist, even yeah. the good oh, guys. Oh, completely. And, yeah. and again, that is so true to the time period. Mm -hmm. And I, it did occur to me, I wondered how Jennifer Egan struggled with writing that time period because it was not a politically, again, my grandparents are from that time period and they were, and they were immigrants, mm -hmm. and yet they were incredibly racist. They were products of their time, you know, and it used to drive me insane. Mm -hmm. But so when I read, when I was reading this book, I was very, very aware of the fact that, well, how is she going to write this? Because people mm. of that time period, it was in, there was no PC. There was no, no. awareness of their own racism. Mm -hmm. So it was fascinating because I even felt like, she was not accurate enough with Anna. Like I felt like Anna had an arc, but Anna would have been more racist, mm -hmm. you know, Likely. but she couldn't be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Written this, written for current modern day audiences, I think you would have lost your audience if mm -hmm. it was represented yeah. any differently than it was. So it made me love her more, I have to say, mm -hmm. that she had such an arc. Mm 
And and even Eddie to a certain extent, because Eddie so, sort of pats himself on the back for not being yeah. horrible to black people, right? <laughs> then he has that moment in Cape Town where he's seeing how um, in South Africa, it's worse than anything he's ever seen before. And he has that moment where he's like, wait a minute, the Bosa, the Nigerian on my boat, I have to respect them for being so principled. He wouldn't even step foot on this land because it's so racist. Like he has like this like yeah. little like yeah. celebration, which was nice to see. Yeah, that was really nice, and and those are moments that were very believable, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and and they were from characters we we respected and we've liked, even though we didn't love everything they did. Right. Yeah, right. I I think I think she did the 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 racism thing really really well. She did, and 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 even though I was a sort of generation behind this time, growing up in the sort of late sixties early seventies, it was it was. Not as bad, but it was still quite similar, and and oh, yeah. racism was just part of life, and it just it, it was just everywhere, and and oh, yeah. it's it's gratifying to see that yes, we have pockets of extreme racism there, particularly uh, against the, the the Muslims in our country, but but sort of we're more of a melting pot amongst sort of blacks and Asians now, um, and. It, that's good to see. So you know things change and you know things will get better, but it mm. takes an awful long time. Well, it's also, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, it's funny you mentioned things are becoming more of a melting pot, but there's a way in which, so I think I, I recommended to you in Slack, Gerald, um, that I recently saw this like great thriller. It's So it's called, a little off topic, but it's called Searching. And it's about a guy who's trying to find his daughter who goes missing, a teenage daughter. And the whole movie is you're seeing everything through screens. So it's their videos that they take for each other, YouTube, oh, text cool. messages. It's never anything in person. Mm -hmm. But you know what actually stood out the most about that movie? The main family is an Asian family. It's Korean Americans. The fact that that was not the point, it was not about Korean Americans. Oh. It was not about being immigrants. It's just Americans who happen to be of Korean background was oh, like- Fantastic. Yeah. Mind blowing, you know? I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that's, I think it's a slow move. I think we have a huge way to go, but yeah, yeah. that's the mm -hmm. movement. And it wasn't even a conversation in the time period in which this novel was set. Mm -hmm. Whereas at least no. now we're having the conversation. Exactly. You know, yeah. In a yeah. big way. And it, it was not happening. And it was really fascinating to read a book about that time period that was so well researched that it felt like an accurate representation of sexism, of racism, and mm. things like that. And yet, there were exceptions. You know, mm -hmm. she made her like she made herself an exception for sexism. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. she made herself the one girl who got to dive. Mm -hmm. You know, which was really interesting. There was that line where she said she always wanted an enemy, the lieutenant who was like stopping her from being a diver. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so we keep saying, you know, this time period, how difficult was it to write this way or to keep all these things in mind? So why do we think Jennifer Egan decided to set the main plot in the 40s? Like, what does that add to the story? Why, why the 40s? Why not now? I, I wasn't probably be, probably because, you know, there was it was such a different time in, in terms of racism and sexism. And she because a lot of the men were away fighting the war, that there was the opportunity for Anna to do the diving. And, and I think, and, and right at the end, when she's, um, when she's looking to, to travel west, and uh, the, the lieutenant guy says, you know, we, we're all going to be out of a job soon anyway, because when the guys come back, they'll want their dive jobs back. Um, and, and so I think it was perhaps because of that and, and the sort of prohibition and the... The sort of gangster era was just coming to an end as well. Well, not coming to an end, changing, I think. Right, changing that style. <laughs> yeah. That style. Yeah. 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 And, and I think also it seems to me that, I mean, if you look at that time period, you know, you, like you said, like Gerald said, we're on the cusp of change in so many eras, areas of the of life and the world. And, and women's roles had changed because of the war. And now they're about to change back, but they can't. They're not going to mm. change back completely, even though that's the expectation. But also just from a practical writerly standpoint, if you set a story in that time period, it's so much easier for someone to disappear. The world mm. isn't as connected. You know, right. you really can just disappear. And you're, you know, it 
she makes a point uh, that, well, if I write a letter, it's going to take at least a day to get to my mother. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm from, if I'm writing from here and then if I'm this distance and even the, the world really was so much more distant, you know, if you mm -hmm. let it be, and yet you had this girl who wanted to bring herself closer to the war somehow. And she mm -hmm. did it by taking this really unusual job. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a pretty fascinating setup. If you look at it, just like, wow, that's got so much possibility. If you set that present day as a writer, a lot of that possibility goes away. We have cell phones, we have the internet, we have, because mm -hmm. believe me, I've tried to write about people disappearing. It's a lot harder to yeah. do. <laughs> Go watch searching. It's the only way that it disappears. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I'm actually working on a novel that I've set in the, it's set in the 70s and I think around the 90s in large part because I need it to be easier for someone to disappear mm -hmm. and not be tracked, you yeah. know, and, and it's fun. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's funny you mentioned that too, because I remember one of the parts where Anna's like, no, she can't sit around anymore. She must act now is her trying to contact her aunt who lives in the same city. It becomes a whole thing. It's a whole <laughs> day of that. Yeah. She has to find a napkin that her aunt brought from a bar for her sister's funeral years ago. Like <laughs> it's, exactly. it's a quest. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were saying Anna, um, she's distinguishing herself. She wants to be a diver. It's at a time when things are changing. But she is also someone who there's a lot of lines about how she likes to disappear in the darkness. She likes keeping secrets. She likes to not be seen. And then she also does these things where she does want to be seen. She does want to be different, right? Like, oh. So what, what do you guys make of that tension in this personality? All the characters, I think, have this tension. But in Anna, who's the main character, she's sort of doing both these things. So I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I don't know. That's when I saw the question, I thought, I have really no idea. Mm. Do you even agree with that premise though? Because I'm leading. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you don't see. No, I think you're like right. Mm. I think you're right. Because I think she and, and that did occur to me when I was reading it, because on the one hand, you know, she's always kind of been in the shadows because everyone's focused on her sister, because her sister takes the care, you know, she's got to be taken care of. Agnes is completely focused on the sister. And then the one person who's her, her father, leaves. She, they think that he leaves. Uh, and he does. Um, so on the one hand, she seems to be seeking to be, like, she wants to be different, you know, because she is seeking out this other job. She doesn't want to be with the married. She's not even interested in being married. But on the other hand, like you said, she's not comfortable with the spotlight on her. Mm -hmm. And yet she ends up on the cover of, was it a flyer or a brochure or something? One of the magazines, As I think. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So there is this tension between, she picks something that's quite visible mm -hmm. to do, you know, and it really distinguishes her and then becomes very inconvenient that it has. Mm -hmm. There yeah. is that tension, definitely. Yeah. And I'm not sure what it means. I think as you were speaking, I realized at a, at a young age, she was already sort of in two worlds because there's that one passage about how whenever, when her dad leaves the house to go for smokes and return the car to Dunnelin, it's like one of like for chapter one or two when he's returning the car and she feels different. She's like when she's with the dad, it's they have some secrets between them. They're running all these errands. It's the adult world. It's going out. And then when he's gone and it's just her, her mother and Lydia, it's a deeper world of like care and responsibility. Yes. Everything is a lot lighter, a lot nicer. So she kind of grew up shape shifting in this way, even at a young age. And even then with her mom, I might be stretching here, but with her mom, she's sort of folding into the recess and being a helper, whatever her mom needs to help Lydia, care for Lydia. And with her dad, she's a bit of a show pony. He brings her along <laughs> because she's charismatic and enchanting. So she's doing both of these things. Yeah, yeah but even even, she, even yeah, even when she first went to, to Dexter's house as, as a child, she was still very different then, wasn't she? And she was still wanting to be different to the uh, Dexter's daughter, what was her name? Tabby. Oh, Tabby, Tabitha. Tabby, of course, Tabby. Tabitha. Um, Tabby. So Who's I, definitely in love with her cousin. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Kissing oh, cousins, yes. the nth degree. Uh -huh. Kissing cousins. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it, 
she she was she was quite a complex character, I think, overall. And and when you say that she was she was in the shadows, but yet she took this job, which was very different. You know, she had a she had a nice cushy job. It well, wasn't nice cushy job. She had a you know an easy enough job, and she she got into the the good books with a supervisor. You know, a little bit of sexual tension there. Um, but she wanted. To, sorry. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm just flagging that. Bring okay. Continue. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, that um, and and then um, but then she wanted to, she wanted to do this thing that was very different and very out of character for a female, and she she said, "I want to do it." You know, I don't care what about you know that it, only men can do it, and she, I, I want to do it. Um, so she was she was yeah she was quite a conflicted character in a way. Mm. I think she was someone who, I'm glad you brought up the first visit at um, Dexter's house when she was a child with Tabitha. Um, that very first um, scene in the nursery where she's, there's a, some doll on the shelf and yes. she really, really wants that doll, but she will not take the doll even when it's offered to her. And there's this way in which she's constantly burying and digging down everything that she wants the most. Like she's, she's extremely private. She doesn't yes. tell people anything unless she absolutely has to. And even then she'll change, she'll, she'll lie. Like, mm. oh, she almost tells Nell the truth about who the father of the baby is, except no, she doesn't okay. at all. Oh, she almost tells Bram, but then not really. So there's a way in which like, she wants what she wants. She wants it intensely, but she will deny herself things constantly in this sort of, I don't know, like it's, it kind of follows her throughout the story. Like um, sometimes, and then sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes she just sort of goes for it. Or she, or if she does go for it, but she knows it's bad, then she's in her head saying, "I'm not really here." Like whenever, whenever she would hook up with a kid when she was 14, it's not me; it's someone else. I'm yeah, not exactly. that kind of girl. Like she has this way where, like, she has this. She compartmentalizes everything about her life in this way. There's the things that she hides even from herself, and things she doesn't want to admit, and the truth. Um, yeah, and actually, her Eddie's a lot like that. Mm -hmm, that's true. Eddie's yeah. very much like that. He compartmentalizes mm. to the point where when he just like it doesn't maybe it occurred to agnes that he had it certainly brianne certainly we get the impression at the end that she, i mean not just because he was sending her money but she kind of knew what her brother was involved in but we never really know if agnes did and anna certainly didn't know what he was really doing mm -hmm. you know and eddie wasn't even sure if agnes knew and it seemed to us that she didn't yeah you but know, anna so, Anna, even at, at a young age, had an inkling a little bit because she immediately was like, oh, something happened to him because he was mixing with gangsters. I think Agnes was oblivious, though. Yeah, yeah, she was oblivious. And it yeah. came through. Like, I like the way she, Jennifer Egan set that up. She, she like, Eddie kind of suspects, well, she must know something. And then we kind of get the impression, no, she doesn't. Mm -hmm. But um, wait, I lost my train of thought. We were talking about, um, oh, how her complex, her complexity. Um, or Eddie no, compartmentalizing. Oh, compartmentalizing. Mm. Yeah, you know what? And it makes, it's, it's to me, that was a great, a really excellent characterization because given the family circumstances, when you've got, you know, the, a, a child who's that profoundly disabled and in that time period when there's nothing they could do for her, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, except keep her comfortable. And the focus is so much on that child that the child the healthier child, there's the guilt, there's the, you know, well, I'm supposed to be helping out. There's the fact that she's a woman in a certain time period where women are caretakers. Mm -hmm. And she does start to compartmentalize and she's not supposed to want anything. Mm -hmm. And so the wants she keeps to herself, mm -hmm. unless she just can't anymore. So it, it really was a great way to characterize her mm -hmm. in a way that she doesn't come out and say it. Yeah. We just see it develop in Anna. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, having a child with that that um, that type of disability at that time when you couldn't do anything else, and also the gendered way of the reason why people pitied. Like, not only was she disabled, but a girl too. That's the greater tragedy because she could have been so beautiful. You could see yes. she would have been beautiful. Everything yeah. came down to that, right? It's not what she could have done with her life, what she could have become, or anything else. It's she. Oh man, she would have been so. More, she would have been more beautiful than Anna. Oh, shucks. Yeah. yeah, and there was no, it's so funny because Anna, if you think about it, Anna is the only one who starts thinking, well, what about, like, she must be bored. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about stimulation? What about letting her see things? 
No, but you're right. I didn't even think about it that way, but you're right. Everybody's talking about how beautiful she would have been yeah. as opposed to, wow, what could she done intellectually? Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, who could she have been? What kind of person? Yeah. That's such a great point. Yeah. And, and, and Anna, uh, Jennifer, you made a point several times of saying, of mentioning the fact that, that Anna shared her secrets with her. She told her everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you got that feeling when, when, when she'd been taken to the, the, the sea with the, the styles and, and she came back and she was suddenly enlivened and she was talking and you think, you're not going to say anything, are you? You're not going to say anything. So I just mm -hmm. wondered whether she let something out of the bag. Oh, I had that same feeling too, like, oh, yeah. she had to like reveal something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the oh, secrets. yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. It could have definitely gone there and it didn't. Mm. Yeah, I had that same thought. Exactly. And, and really, that's, that shows the skill of the writer because she probably thought, I know what people are going to think. I, <laughs> well, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and that would have been kind of a pat way to go. You're right. But it would have been, it would have been interesting, but not as interesting as where she took it. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So real quick, that I'm coming back to that asterisk. So you said there was sexual tension or you, you read sexual tension between Anna and Charlie. I didn't read any sex, sexual tension between them, actually. Everybody else thought there was. Everybody else was gossiping. But to me, I don't think Anna was attracted to Charlie, and Charlie was definitely gay. I don't know. Yeah, I thought Charlie was gay. Yeah. Okay. Dexter pinned him as gay. I yeah, but I I thought when she when he first started showing an interest in her, I thought there was this seemed to be something going on. I I genuinely got the feeling that that he was interested in her um, in in more than a, a sort of work colleague way. Hmm. But, That's funny. Yeah. I. I I didn't read okay. it that way at all. Yeah. In fact, yeah, I didn't the way, that he, way. He was, yeah, the way that he was enthusiastic about like how she looked even read a little bit to me, like when like gay friends or say to women, "Oh, girl, you're so beautiful," but like the 1940s version of that, like it was like <laughs> the gay best friend sort of compliments. Yeah. Didn't have that like okay. sexual implication in my reading of it. But when Brienne was like, okay, you can either give up the baby or you can marry someone. Your options for marrying someone are somebody who you've been rejecting your whole life and now you can't do better than, or a gay man. I was like, Charlie, Charlie, I was rooting for her. Oh, God, yeah. I wanted that so bad. Charlie's Aww. such a good guy. I love Charlie. Charlie was a great character. He really yeah. was. There was something really solid and, pra yeah, he was great. And I, had, I was rooting for that same outcome. Mm -hmm. And even though I knew she probably wouldn't go that way, I mean, she the yeah. writer, but yeah, I was rooting for the same outcome. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'll just go with Charlie. And actually, you know what's funny? It, it, before Charlie really was flushed out, it, it was just that first scene, the first time he calls her into his office because she came late from lunch. Um, and it passes without incident. In the era of Me Too, I, the bar is so low. I was like, what a good guy. Mm -hmm. Great. Before you know <laughs> so he's true. gay. Yeah, I was just like, yay. There was no sexual harassment in this scene. That's so true. What a low I had the same reaction. Yeah, just like relief, like yay. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The bar is low. Yeah, the bar is really low <laughs> right now. Not you, Gerald. You've cleared the bar many, many times over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we um, we talked about how Anna compartmentalizes, and she she does it in a way that her father did. Ed as well. We're starting to talk about that. So he has this way in which he's not of the underworld, but also of the underworld, but the cop of the underworld. He's above this, but he's not, and he goes deeper into it. So okay, what did you guys make of that tension back and forth in Ed? You go, Colette. I'm I'm still thinking. Uh, I have to. Well, I bought it mm -hmm. until he until his friend's funeral when he decided to become an informant for the state attorney's office you didn't think he snitch no it, it was like he turned on a dime i didn't mm. feel like that that was that felt very like i felt the author's hand there mm -hmm. it felt like okay this has to happen so that he has to disappear and so we get that parallel between eddie and dexter later Mm -hmm. But it didn't, it didn't, it was one of those moments where I, I, I was popped out it, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't have a lot of those moments, but that moment, I would say it'd be that moment, the affair between Anna and Dexter and the ending, I popped out. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh. because it, it, it felt contrived. 
mm-hmm. more contrived than than the rest of the book. Especially since my sense was that Ed liked Dexter more than he liked Dunnelin by a lot. He had exactly. really critical, horrible thoughts of Dunnelin. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I felt the same way. I mean, I and I just like, um, and I can't say his name, the childhood friend. I just like that guy as much as Eddie seemed to. And then all of a sudden at that, like before uh, Dunnelin gets killed, Eddie starts coming around. Mm-hmm. Like he's remembering why he cared about this guy and mm-hmm. and it didn't, it rang yeah. false. It had been two years of working with Dexter, liking Dexter. Yeah. And Dexter's so much more likable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it just, it didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially you know. knowing the consequences. Eddie's not a stupid guy. He's never made a stupid choice. Mm-hmm. Why would he make a stupid choice now? Right. Right, especially because he makes a stupid choice and then he's completely prepared to Houdini his way out of being whacked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he's exactly. smart enough to be the Houdini of the, of the underworld, but yeah. Well, was there a foreshadowing of his, his previous life in, in vaudeville or whatever it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said it was all his tricks from vaudeville that paid off. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, but I didn't, was, was, there, was there any mention of that before? Yes, the there was a was bit. There, there was a okay. bit. Um, that's how he met Agnes. That's, that's very, of course, it is. Yes, that's how he met Agnes. But there wasn't much. Mm-hmm. No. And again, that's another point. Whereas riches, I love. I love the way she rich, richly, and she builds these rich backgrounds for all of the characters. But that in particular, that particular background felt okay. I need this here. It didn't feel integral to Eddie throughout. Mm-hmm. You know, so that when she brought it up again, I'm like, oh, that's convenient. Mm-hmm. You know, him being able to escape because of his vaudeville days, but <laughs> his vaudeville days didn't feel enough a part of him. Mm-hmm. You know, you know how some things just like Anna's diving, mm-hmm. the whole time that the whole the secrecy of it, the darkness of it, everything. Like once she got into the water, I'm like, oh, I get this. I get why mm-hmm. this person wants to do this, and it became part of her and part of every decision she made. Right. Whereas Eddie, having been in vaudeville. It was mm-hmm. just some historic detail about him that wasn't part of him. And Agnes actually being a dancer, though, felt part of her. Yeah, mm-hmm. because that, that came back a couple of times, didn't it, yeah. during the during the, the book that, you know, and, and especially with Brianne, so, uh, mm-hmm. and her her previous career sort oh, of God, kept yeah. coming. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and, and uh, so I thought, yeah, I think Eddie's, that's why I said, was, it, was there any mention of it beforehand? And, and I, I remember there was now, but it was, it was like that was then and this is now and and there was yeah. no it, it's sort of yeah we've dropped that in because i'm going to call back to it later but now we're moving on and, and i just like to see it sort of just dropped in every so every so often yeah mm-hmm. yeah well, it was the same with his swimming ability because part of his, his ability to escape mm. when he got dropped in the water was that he was a great swimmer and we know that from when he saved those two other kids mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But mm. and then I guess at one point one of Anna's childhood memories is her father getting out of the water after he goes swimming. Mm-hmm. But again, swimming wasn't something that felt integral to who Eddie was. Mm. So it just kind of felt like I need to put these moments in here so that when he escapes, it feels plausible. Mm. And yeah. also Anna's own attraction to the water felt mm. plausible. You know the fact that she, yeah, but Eddie, another Eddie... one of those moments. Eddie also had that attraction to water because one of the reasons when he was thinking, when he escapes um, after the death, he's like, okay, so initially his plan is pick up Agnes, Anna and Lydia right. and leave. And then he's like, wait, I don't want to live in Minnesota. It's too far from the sea. He had that little moment too. Exactly. But at the end of the day, he left because he doesn't want to deal with the disability. Ever. Doesn't. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. actually, I was going to say, Robert, with Eddie, my favorite scenes with him actually were when he was doing the merchant, um, the merchant yes. when he, that, that was my favorite part. Like, I yeah. loved all of that. And the um, when they were uh, shipwrecked, when they were out at sea for 20 something days, those were, I think, for me, some of the best scenes. I love those yes. scenes. And I felt like I was in a different novel completely. Like, I jumped into oh, another novel. It's, I, I, it's, it's funny. I was just going to say that, that, that just to, talking about Eddie, he was he was probably one of the least well fleshed out characters to me in the first part of the book or in the first two thirds of the book and then once he escapes then he comes becomes real and you see his interactions with with ordinary people and 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 you know what he does and 
I, I think, yeah, especially when they're shipwrecked, that uh, and his interactions with the bosun and all that stuff, um, much, much better, much it was stronger. Beautiful. Yeah, those I, I completely agree. That was beautifully handled and it was so gripping mm -hmm. and fast. And you're right, we learned who he really was mm. in those scenes because and and I hadn't thought about it that way, but he does feel like it feels like a different book. You're right. Mm. That part felt like a different book. And quite frankly, he almost feels like a different character in that yes. part. Because yes. he's not, we don't really know him in the beginning. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. That's true. Yeah. And he's suddenly he like funny. Yeah. He was yeah. never funny. And now he's oh. cracking jokes with Spark. <laughs> they, have, they have like a rapport. And then when the bosun's like not speaking and they're on the raft and he uses the flowery British accent, he's talking. I, love that. And he, I laughed out loud. I thought that was great. <laughs> and he's suddenly funny out of nowhere. Yeah. 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 But he's, yeah, I'd say he's probably the most inconsistent character. Mm -hmm. And yet I loved him because of that section, because yeah. of yeah. the marine stuff. I loved him. Mm -hmm. Also, I just love the way that it was written. I feel like just real quick jumping to craft when oh. the boatswain jumps out of the lifeboat, swims to the raft, pulls himself up, and cuts down Fairfield with a hatchet in under a minute. It was not, it was it honestly, I was reading it came out of nowhere for me as it was supposed to. And that's hard. I think it's hard to like surprise a reader that way. I'm yes. like, out of nowhere, this guy just got hacked. Great. You know? Yeah, that was awesome. Her action. Awesome. <laughs> she she is one of the best craftspeople I have ever read. She mm -hmm. and she knows writing so and she knows herself as a writer so well that she will just go do something that like if I were teaching a writing class, I might say to like some beginning writer, yeah, you know, these are the rules. You probably don't want to do that, whatever. She can just kind of take the rules and screw with them yeah. because yeah. she knows her craft so brilliantly. I mean she's just a fun yeah. And, and I you agree. go with That's her. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, you go you, you go with her when she breaks the rules because you know from what's gone before that she knows the rules. She engages you as a reader. So you just go right along with it and, and you think, yeah. well, <laughs> it's just very I clever. mean, she, she in, in talking about crap, she somehow made this entire book like gray. Like she, the book has a color to it, right? It has a <laughs> mood to it. And she, she really maintains does. it. Yeah, she yeah. maintains it throughout. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it was just, it was beautiful. And the way that she describes things sometimes, she described someone's confidence, it was Dexter's confidence as a as a snake coiling in his stomach. It was beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Was incredible? She, it was she's, incredible. Oh my God. She, she's the, she, her, her metaphors and similes and her, mm -hmm. they're just, they're concrete. Yeah. Mm. And yet they're elegant and, and they're not intrusive. Like you don't no, feel like there's no. this florid flowery prose and yet her prose is gorgeous, yeah. you know, it, and so memorable. Like I remember that one too. That was one of my favorites. Yeah. I, especially cause it, it's like, I had a lot of moments where I'd highlight them and I'm like, who thinks of this? Like yeah. who, yes. who compares it to a snake writhing in your stomach for confidence? Like out of nowhere yeah. and it and, worked, and it was great. That was perfect for him. Yes. Because that's part of his world. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. every everything in his world is off color mm -hmm. and is is underworld. Yeah, it was perfect for Dexter. Mm. Yeah. And so you were saying it's perfect for Dexter because everything in his world's off color. But he sort of has this shift towards the end where he wants to become legitimate. Yep. Part of it I think was purely financial. When the war is over, I want my money to be legitimate and clean. But I think part of it was something more, but I can't quite put my finger on exactly why now. I had that problem too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Why now? Because there was that whole scene with, with Mr. Q, this mysterious Mr. Q, where where they were sort of talking in in hints all the time. And and you know, we should go to Uncle. And I was thinking, who's uncle? I, I, I you know, may, maybe in America it's, it's obvious, but, but no, it wasn't to me. But no context, literally. I figured it out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and I just think, well, it, it's, it's sort of kind of strange, and, and it seemed to, it seemed to go on a long time, and, and we get it. This guy is sort of enigmatic, and he's the big boss. Um, but it, it just seemed to go nowhere, and, and, and the guy says no, and that's it. It's just. I don't know. It seemed to be a bit of a filler to me. 
Yeah. Oh, well, and then he brings it up with his father-in-law, who also says no, mm. you know, and, and yeah, it did kind of seem to be a film. I mean, was it, and it wasn't linked to Anna, you know, it wasn't no. linked to meeting Anna. It was something about him finally wanting to be, maybe, I mean, I did have the thought that now that his wife is trying to be, is, is more, she's now kind of gone back to her roots, unfortunately, her waspy kind of, okay, the, the life I kicked in the balls, I'm now going back to. Um, and maybe he's thinking, well, these people have never accepted me, but if I go, you know, I can become, we can become more of us. But that stuff wasn't really there, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree. That kind of is just kind of hanging there. Mm-hmm. Also, I got confused as to why they killed him. What was his great offense? I think this, this was my theory. And I think, I wish I could find the language in there because I think I highlighted it. I think he he had that final thought of remember his brother-in-law saw him driving mm-hmm. away with Anna wasn't the thought that he had told the father-in-law mm-hmm. and the, the father-in-law always said the one thing you can't do is cheat on my daughter mm-hmm. and the impression I got was that the father-in-law and Mr. Q both were like no you can't go this route and then the father-in-law also had the added, well, now you've cheated on my daughter. And the two, that, that's what got him killed. That ultimately the two worlds collided and got him killed because he yeah. was going to, he was going to stop being, he was going to stop being valuable for what he was good at. And he had cheated on the daughter. Yeah, that's but, what I, that's yeah. what I got from it. That's what I don't know thinks. if I'm right. Right. Well, but that's... I don't know if I'm right. Mm-hmm. That's what Dexter thinks. So right. you're right that that's what Dexter thinks. But I just don't know to me if that's believable because yeah, what George I saw agree. isn't enough to believe that he cheated on his wife. Uh, George didn't see anything. I don't even believe George would snitch. Why would George <laughs> snitch? <laughs> that's that been covering for you for your like decades long affair with like uh, God knows how many women. Yeah, and uh, and you're cheating with your sister in law. Hello. Hell- yeah. Why would he ever? Why would he ever tell? And mm-hmm. why would Dexter think he would tell? Yeah. And why it wasn't yeah, enough and, animosity. Right. And, it, and George didn't even see anything. So that already seems far-fetched. And then, even if, I mean, as far as Mr. Q and Behringer know, he is still doing what he's supposed to be. Like, mm-hmm. he hasn't stopped being valuable yet. Wouldn't you wait to see if he actually stops being valuable? Exactly. Like running your casinos. like and, and doing a good job, supposedly. Yeah, doing a good job. Like, why would just be like, oh, he had a bad idea. We told him no. Guess we gotta kill him. Like it just, it just seemed a bit yeah. much. Like, well, and especially know. bringing back that. Oh, uh, what I want to say, Bugsy, and I know his name is in Bugsy, the Chicago kid. Badger. 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 Badger Thank yeah. you. I love that name, Badger. I can't believe I didn't remember it. Badger but, stroke Jimmy. Yeah, but bringing exactly, but bringing <laughs> back Badger to do the job also felt very. That's that's when it really felt plot driven. You know, like yet, yeah, that's not enough. You know, they ha- we haven't seen enough hatred between the two of them for me to buy that Badger hates him this much that he can't wait to kill him. And also yeah. to buy that Mr. Q would let him. Because yeah. Dexter, no matter what's happening, Dexter's still more valuable a commodity than mm-hmm. Badger is. You would think. Yeah. yeah. Not think. only that, but Mr. Q forgave him for bringing on the guy who snitched to the state attorney's office could yes. look past that, but couldn't look past. Maybe you had an affair on some. Uh, you know what I mean? In a and maybe you had a bad idea. idea. Mm. And maybe you had a bad idea that, as far as I know, you're not implementing. Yeah. And that isn't even actually that bad of an idea, anyway. Let's just be honest. Oh. Like yeah, not. Yeah. No, and, and it, it just felt a lot. Mm-hmm. Quite frankly, that it seems to me that that's the way a lot of um, underworld figures went anyway, because they needed places to clean their money. So mm-hmm. they did go the more legitimate route. So eventually that's the way the world went anyway. Mm-hmm. So he would have probably been proved right. Right. Yeah, I agree. That that, I, that was, yeah. Why did he, yeah. So, the, so I guess it's sort of like, we love it because her craft is beautiful and she explores some themes so well, but we don't know what the big takeaway is. And why did Dexter get killed? I don't know. Why did like there's a few big ones? It's like why did Eddie snitch? Uh, it had to happen. Like there's a few big plot happen. points. Like it had to happen. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They it's it's one of those things where it that's oh, one of those things. Those things don't feel character driven enough to me. They don't feel like they're coming from the characters she oh. set up. They're coming from the plot. 
So it's mm-hmm. almost, and I, I, That's a good point, I shouldn't yeah. say this, but it's kind of like, a little bit of James Patterson took over. You know, those <laughs> the commercial big novelists and like, okay, we need that. We have this great plot. We want to keep it going. Yeah. So we got to find a way to justify it. And mm-hmm. she's just such a great writer. I'm willing to go with it, mm-hmm. but I always, I had glitches, you know, like my yeah. mind would glitch. I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, but, but this and- one, this one could have been fixed just by having someone else who would snitch actually catch him in the act. It's fixed. You could yeah. conceivably yeah, exactly. see, yeah, like it's so easy to fix. Just get, get, have him get caught. Maybe Harry yeah. catches him and snitches to her dad. There you go. Yeah, exactly. And, and there was, was there some intimation that someone had been at the boathouse? Remember, Mister Q brought up the boathouse, mm. and that well, it was kind of, and it was right after he'd been at the uh, Dexter had been at the boathouse with Anna, but I may be making that up. No, no, I think, think I think wait, it was. It was it was when um, when Dexter goes to the boathouse yeah. to sleep with right, Anna to see someone else has been there and that he gets yeah. obsessed with that. Yeah, and that that's where they take people to whack him. That's where he took Ed. So then when he's told to go there by Mr. Q, he's like, I gotta I gotta intimidate someone else. He's sending me here to, to crack the apples <laughs> at someone. And it's like, oh no, it's me. So what were, <laughs> we supposed, to, what were we supposed to take away from the fact that when he goes to the boathouse with Anna? he sees evidence that someone else had been there. Had Jimmy been there before maybe? Yeah. Is that the what we're supposed to think? Yeah. Maybe the only thing we're supposed to think is he doesn't have his finger on every pulse. There's things happening behind his back and they're excluding him from big decisions. That might be mm. it. But again, Somebody why? Somebody wants to get killed. And why? Yeah. yeah. Why? What, why? Was, was Dexter involved in the killing of Eddie or the attempted killing of Eddie? Yeah. Yeah, he was there, he was. right? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was that parallel where at the end he was like, he remembers when he did this to Eddie, he offered the drink. Same oh, okay. as back to oh. me. You know what? That was the passage, I think, um, Gerald, wasn't, was that the passage you were talking about when parallel things are happening and it got hard to follow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. you're right. And that was where we find out. And that was another place, as beautifully as she told it, mm. it felt convenient that these things were so parallel because Eddie drank, supposedly drank the drought that was going to make him pass out. And in fact, he didn't drink it and Dexter knew not to drink it. And yeah, it felt I convenient. thought it was weird that they're poisoning him. Why are they even poisoning him? Don't just like shoot people shoot in the neck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Why wouldn't they just shoot him and then throw him into the bay or throw yes. him into the Hudson? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a bit like the, the, the Batman series when I was a kid, when, when, you know, they'd set up this complicated, death thing suspended above this boiling acid and say, duh, see you next week. And, and you know, they escape, of course. Just of course. shoot them. Just be done with it. Well, yeah. wouldn't that have been the way it went with Eddie, yeah, right? I'm yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, I mean, we need, and, and, okay, as writers, we've all been there when we need something to happen, so you figure out how to make it happen, and she needed him to be awake. Yeah. in the water <laughs> yeah so they had mm-hmm. to poison. they had to they had to give him some drug that's going to knock him out mm-hmm. yeah. but yeah he did have yeah. that there was that it's it's sort of kind of I, I i think we've read books like this before when when the the sort of first half of it it's fantastic and multi-layered and beautiful language and and it's you, you just wonder whether the the publishers publishers sending me emails saying uh, come on you know we need this manuscript and <laughs> oh geez i got to, I got to start finish it off. It, it just it, we said earlier. It just seemed a little bit rushed towards the end, yes. and and it changed from sort of beautiful character driven story to very much a plot driven story later on, and um, and and lost something. I think. Yeah, I agree. And yet, and yet, I wanted to finish it. Like yeah, I did oh, keep turning pages. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. No, did you guys have the feeling that this is just me? For me, it ended like five times. It was a little bit like the end of Lord of the Rings. So, like, I first thought because of the way that it was written. So, at the end of that chapter, when um, there, uh, it's Eddie and the bosun are out on the raft, and Eddie is like about to die, and the bosun's like, "We're almost there. God's coming, or God hasn't left us yet, or something like that." And I'm like, the story was about Eddie all, all along. The book just ended. No, it did it. Okay, <laughs> that, that, that just read like a final chapter, like the final scene. No, it did. I agree. I agree. I thought he died. I'm like, and I guess it was about Eddie all along somehow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, even in the last few pages, I kept thinking, oh, this must be the ending. Oh, no, look, there's yeah. more. 
And it ends uh, here. No, it, yeah, a thousand endings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. the actual ending was what felt convenient. Yes. Yeah. Very. Mm -hmm. Very. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it I just. I, I after she, you know, she after she'd lost, she she did sort of, you know, mention briefly that when they first met up again, you know, she slapped him and all all this sort of stuff. So we we got the idea that she was angry with him for going away and, and leaving them. But it just, I don't know. It it's it's just it's almost like a happy ever after type thing. It's. You know, the sort of, it, it, like the he, it's almost like the the prodigal son. He's sort of prodigal father comes back, and and everything's all right again. And uh, yeah, well, yeah. It, it almost felt like uh, it almost felt like she got the note. It almost felt like it it probably ended at different places that we're thinking felt like endings, <laughs> and she kept getting the note. But you haven't wrapped up this thread of the story. You haven't mm. brought them back together and readers want that satisfaction of seeing what happens when they're all back together because you yeah. set it up and you haven't paid it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, but it felt, it wound up feeling pat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? and, 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 you know, you sometimes you sort of feel like a better ending would be for him to come back but not make contact and just to watch her coming out of the movie theater and, yeah. and walking off, you know, and, and, you sort of think, yeah, that that would be a, like would be more fitting rather than this sort of getting back together and yeah. I, it, I, I would have felt more satisfied by it. I agree. Yeah. I would I, okay. that felt like where it was going to end. I'm like, okay, that I would buy. Yeah, um, you know. Yeah. But to take it that one step past, eh. yeah. This conversation's <laughs> sort of affirming for me this review I found. That's like the beauty of the stories and the details. So our biggest disappointments are with the a plot. All the big moments in the a plot felt contrived, but. At least for me, I love all these little scenes. I love yes. on the train when people see that she's pregnant and they look for the wedding band before they'll like offer her water or be kind to her. Or like um, the whole casino scene with Nell and how like Nell's a little territorial <laughs> until she sees Anna's not a threat. Like all these little things <laughs> that happen that are just anything with Brienne in it. Um, yes. Yes. Fantastic. yes. Very good. Um, yeah. And all, and I think that's what for me kept me turning the page, and that more so than the a plot. Like that's what I was just like, oh, I need more of these like beautiful insights into human relationships and how thing, you know, sexism, racism, the way that people are prejudiced against people with disabilities. Like I love that scene where Eddie's talking about how he he would hate carrying Lydia down the stairs, and he's cataloging the way that all the different neighbors react with pity, with anger, <laughs> with judgment, right, or, or with yeah. sorrow. And he hates yeah. all of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was great. And I even yeah. loved like the there's that moment um, when Dexter like actually connects with the twins when he, they're watching the boats, mm -hmm. and so it humanized him so much. And the twins were funny, and and it also showed you the distance that had grown between mm -hmm. these family members, between fathers and sons, and it made such an, a subtle, wonderful commentary on father son relationships. So yeah, those moments riveted me because she's just, she's such a close observer of human nature mm -hmm. and she just nails yeah. intimate yeah. relationships, you know, between all different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I totally agree. Those, that's what keeps me reading with her. Also, she, does she have teenagers? Because she just hits it on the nail on the head uh, with both Dexter and Ed, that moment where they're like, wait a minute, my daughter, now that she's a yes. teenager, is not at all how she used to be when she was younger, but it's like perfect. I'm like, <laughs> yep. I agree. I agree. Let's talk about uh, your mommy woes. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah, she does. And that does. That just kept me in it. Yeah. yeah. And kept me caring because, you know, we could have very well not cared about Dexter. You know, yes. But she really, he's a nuanced character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And yet there is, like, even when he's like racism in his head, is different from racism in Anna's head. And family relationships are different in his head than they are in Eddie's head. And it was really, it, it was, yeah, I, I did not think I was gonna like him as a character and I wound up loving him. Mm -hmm. you know, I really, he was a really interesting character. Mm -hmm. um, and he his was the most, in a lot of ways, his was the most contrived plot line. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and yet I loved him. I really yeah. enjoyed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think it's the best character for me. Yeah. And I think part of that's because when you're in his head, again, she's a sharp observer of human nature, and so was Dexter. So you're seeing him yes. be really smart in how he reads people. So you're like, oh, you just like him for that skill. 
Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Also, let's talk about Brienne. So, <laughs> <laughs> why not? I love Brienne so much. Also, so you know, we were saying that this novel's like very well researched. You know, all the gossip she was saying about socialites is all true too. So at first, I thought it was all made up until I read Evelyn Nesbitt. I'm like, I've read that story recently, and that story made the rounds. How Henry Shaw, Evelyn Nesbitt's husband, murdered her uh, her lover, Stanford White, in Madison Square Park. That's all real. So as soon as I saw Evelyn Nesbitt, I was like, wait a minute. All of those starlets were real. All of them. Yeah. Isn't that great? I Amazing. love that. I mean, and she seemed to have researched every single thing down to the detail like that. Like like when the um, at the end when she's talking about how um, Anna will see the ship going into mm -hmm. the harbor, but she'll see the film reel. Clearly, she had watched that film reel as many times as Anna had. Mm -hmm. And it was fabulous. Like, I love mm -hmm. that just the whole, dis her descriptive powers, it could have been boring. And I know you, one of your things that you brought up was some people, some readers said they found all that historical detail dense and hard to get through. I loved it. Yeah. I and loved it. To me, that's what made it worth reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so, and, and I think she delivered that detail really well. So uh, even 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 the even the, the part where she did the first dive and and they were saying now this part weighs so many pounds and this part weighs so many pounds, I, I didn't feel that the author was just dumping information on me at this point. I I felt that that's what they would say to her, and yeah. and you know to give her an idea and to make her aware that this stuff is heavy, um, and and that. You know, I really like that. She, she. I think she, she did that that scene mm -hmm. really well, where she and and conveyed the the feelings of Anna, um, as she, you know, she was determined to walk with that suit on and and do undo the knot. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it was a fabulous scene. I agree. And, and and the bit where she cut the the rope off the propeller later on, and and and, and it was tense. Came up and, yeah, crikey. Yeah, it, it, and and you know, I had the guy was it Katz who's bawling her out mm -hmm. and saying she's going to get going to get her sacked, and then she goes, Whoa, and he saves her life. Whoa! Yeah, that, that was, was that was fantastic. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, that. and one of the th and just to go back to something, Gerald, that you said, one of the th reasons I think I did love the historical detail is it always felt like he was there because it was necessary for us to help us understand the circumstances and the mm. character. It didn't feel like it was just there because, okay, you guys need to know this. You readers <laughs> here, let me show you how much I know, or yeah. gee, I need to create the feeling that we're back in this time period. It felt like we, like, I completely agree. We needed to know the weight of each piece of that suit because then we felt it right along with her. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I loved, I, I thought she did a great job of making those details necessary. Yeah. And going back to how, you know, you were saying that that scene with cats with the propeller and everything, mm. all that's all B plot stuff. And it was great, yeah. right? Yeah. B plot's the best part. <laughs> and also <laughs> when Lieutenant Axel is like, Yeah, I'll make that transfer for you, but you know, I gotta tell you, you'd be surprised to hear this, but like a lot of guys can be like real sexist. <gasps> They're not gonna want a that lady so die. That was so great. That was so great. Yeah, that was very, very good. I loved that bit. <laughs> That was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so we still to talk about Brienne. So why do yeah. we love Brienne so much? <laughs> okay, I, I, it, she because she's so well drawn. She's yeah. She's such a lively character. She's got a great, and and she's unapologetic. She's you know she's yes, had this, this great life. She's still having this great life, and and the way she sort of talks about her her partners, boyfriends, whatever. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, and her dialogue was so great as well. Really I'm enjoyed it. up right her. now that one line she says, or was it like wishing men dead to be nary one in sight or something? Yeah, there was nary one left, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Brienne. Well, she's too real. She's kind of like, she's she's the, the reality check, you yeah. know, for, for, for Anna and her mother. You know, and yet she's not. Like, she never reveals that the brother's been sending money which yeah. I love. I, I actually thought that reveal to me felt so, and I think, you know what? I think, I feel like that reveal surprised me, but felt so organic because I bought that Brienne wouldn't tell them. I bought yeah. it because Brienne was such a real character. She was so beautifully drawn. Yeah. That that's who she was. She could keep secrets. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she was so savvy. Like as soon as Anna walks in, she's just like, so how many, <laughs> how long has it been since your last period? Yeah. I have to say, I actually momentarily hated Anna near the end when they're leaving, they're in the cab, leaving Manhattan or going to Penn Station or whatever it is. Mm. And she's like, I can't believe I have to go. You know, I'm I'm leaving the city with this old woman as my only companion. Yes, that line bothered me. Pissed me off. I, just, I was I got so mad. <laughs> yeah, that line pissed me off too. Yeah, mm. it really did. And first of all, it didn't sound like Anna. No. Mm-hmm. You know, and and there was a whole strange rap out there about of really derogatory stuff about Brienne that didn't feel right. It didn't feel in character and it got my back up because I loved Brienne. Brienne had been portrayed in such a Anna herself is making us, is belittling her and I didn't buy it and it pissed me off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially since you get the sense that after Ed left, Brienne was their lifeline. It was for Agnes, her social life. That was her best friend. Yeah. And you even got the sense when Anna was younger, she liked the whole thing where it's like, oh, you're old enough for a drink. You want it? No. Oh, you're so innocent. Like that whole game yeah. was like part of the relationship. Like, why are you yeah, exactly. judging her? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. We need a Brienne book. She's great. <laughs> she is great. She's, I even love the way she is, even though, again, I don't know if I buy it. I love the way she is with the baby at the end. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it's just. Yeah. yeah, I kind of buy it. I buy it. I feel like she's exhausted at this point. She has lived a <laughs> whole life. She even says it. She's like, I've done everything but that. Everything but raised baby. And I have to say, I love the way she quickly gets from, I'm just going to take you to the station. I'm just going to take you through Chicago. That felt so her. So I'm okay. just, I'll just stay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to live now in your apartment forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> yeah. So we're definitely over the hour. Yeah. We can talk about this book wow. forever. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I think we hit almost everything. Is there any other minor characters you guys want to talk about that stood out for you? Talked about Charlie. Not really. Mm-hmm. I wish there was more of Nell. I like Nell. Yeah, I like Nell too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah there, there, there's so many her. characters, weren't there? There were so many really interesting and well-drawn characters that, that deserved a bigger part, but then, you know, the book was big enough already, but it, it would have made a huge book to give them a stronger part, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, like, her, like Anna's friendship with um, Bascom and Marl, it was just, oh, yeah. it was so sweet by the end, how it just, you know, Dexter had that moment, he's like, he's watching men and women work alongside each other without an awareness of the fact that they're men and women, like just working together as equals without any sort of sexual tension or any awkwardness. Um, and it was just kind of nice to see them become a little group, you know, because- yeah, um, I loved that. Yeah, it was nice. It was really nice. Yeah. It was, I wish there was more had, of it. Yeah, and, and there was something about the way she, again, it's handling the, the subplots. There's something about the way she handled that plot that was really endearing. And I think mm-hmm. it's because those characters, even though they're not, and we, we want more of them, but they were so well drawn, mm. even though they're minor characters, we care about them. Yeah. And then I, we and even I, ended up caring about the lieutenant. Yeah. A bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it was, I, I thought, yeah, that, that Merle, when, when she'd noticed Merle was sort of a bit of an outsider, a bit of, you know, kept, kept back after the others went. And, and yet the, the guy, the, the, was it cats or, or the lieutenant put them together and forced them together and 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 then Mel come up and said hello miss feeney or we meet mm-hmm. we finally meet miss feeney and you think ah oh, he's all right because you, you wonder is he a bit weird is there something wrong with him mm-hmm. he says hello miss feeney just mm-hmm. yeah he's a nice guy yeah Dexter has that moment where he sees that marl's a diplomat that marl's just very good at smoothing over any situation i love yeah. that yeah mm-hmm. yeah okay I think uh, we've discussed it. Is there anything else before we wrap it up? Because no, I think we're I we're think at we're... an hour and ten. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like <laughs> much less time now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, it's just I really loved it. Um, I still don't know what the big takeaway still, is. Yeah. I agree. I, I, don't I don't think there. I, I don't. I think if we did that would have meant that those 
plot holes would have been filled in. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what's missing. That's why those those plot pieces that we talked about that just felt like plot and not, mm -hmm. you know, they had to be yeah. there. Yeah, I think that's that's what's missing. I, I mm -hmm. think you're right. We don't know why. Yeah. And I think that's fine. Like, yeah. yeah, like I said, when you really love a book, when you really love yeah. a book, you walk away because of the plot, the characters, the prose, and also the thing you're screaming about is what you learn. So it's almost like I don't have this like need to like tell everybody, read this book, read this book, read this book, even though I yeah. really liked it, which is strange. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a sort of book when somebody mentions it, you said, oh, I read that book and I really liked it, but you wouldn't go out of your way to recommend it. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I feel the same way. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let's see how we feel about next month's book, because next month we're reading Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan. We're jumping on the bad wagon, seeing what it's all about. <laughs> As you read the book, let us know your thoughts on Twitter with the hashtag LRH Book Club or join our discussion group on Facebook, The Literary Roadhouse Readers. A link is provided in the show notes. And what's a gal got to do around here to get an iTunes review? Square up her shoulders, wear a 200-pound diving suit, and untie a bowline knot? Come on, done. <laughs> now, go please leave a review on iTunes and Stitcher. It helps make our show better by helping others find us. Also, we don't have casinos or a protection racket to fill our coffers. Help support the podcast expenses at patreon.com slash the Dree Roadhouse. Every bit helps. Like, really, $5 helps. All right, guys, this is great. Lovely. Thank yeah, you. Wonderful. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Hopefully Colette will now be a regular host. That's... Yep. I'd love that. Yeah. I would love that, too. Yeah. I love it. Great. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.